Hello, I'm George Mason, host of Good God, conversations that matter about faith and public life. Can faith and work come together in a positive way? Troy Dungan, trusted weatherman for three decades at Channel 8, will be talking about just that. Welcome to Good God. We're glad to welcome today Troy Dungan, someone that many of you have known for uh, more than three decades when he was the weatherman, the meteorologist at WFAA Channel 8 mm -hmm. News, and we uh, came to trust him and to depend upon his <laughs> wisdom, uh, being a prophet, uh, telling us <laughs> what the, the weather was going to be like That's tomorrow right. and the days ahead. And uh, that's a dubious business to be in a prophet, well, isn't it? Well, not quite in the league with Daniel, but yes. I was, I'd give it my best. In fact, Dale Hansen was telling somebody, he said, oh, this guy, he's, he's wrong more than he's right. I said, Hansen, you try predicting the ball scores 10 days out. Said, <laughs> exactly. Oh, okay, you okay. got me there. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Well, if only Dale Hansen had an opinion or two. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, when I make a speech, I'll say, one thing I learned something from Dale Hansen here, and they said, uh, nervous <laughs> laughter. But well, what I learned, and, and you can appreciate this too, and so can Jim White, our producer, uh, when you're making a speech, it's always good to say at the outset, now you see where my chair is, you see where I am, don't stop applauding till I get back to my chair. Because <laughs> it's embarrassing if they stop before you get back. Well, I learned that from Hanson. Oh, and of I course. And I think that's the only thing I've learned from Hanson. Oh, uh, well, <laughs> actually, uh, you know, he's... Uh, He's becoming famous less now, I think, for his sports uh, broadcasting mm -hmm. than he is for his editorializing. Exactly, and, uh, exactly. Uh, it's really been uh, quite a new uh, step in his career as well. It's funny we should talk about Dale Hansen here, but right. it came up. And Dale is, people say, what's he really like? I said, you see what you get. Huh. He's got no filter on his mouth. What's in his brain comes out. <laughs> That's exactly <laughs> and Often right. it's good and sometimes yeah. it's yeah. dubious. Well. <laughs> For all of us. Yeah. Oh, hate mm -hmm. to think of some of my old sermons, as a oh, matter yeah, of yeah. fact. Right? Yeah, I got yeah. Some, some things I'd like back. <laughs> right, right. Well, I, I want to probe a little bit with you. We uh, have talked about the fact that you have written this book, uh, Jesus Makes Salsa by the Seashore. Mm -hmm. And it's really based upon uh, Bible studies that you did at WFAA. Absolutely. And they all, everything is right out of the Bible. I'm not seminary trained. I'm a right. Christian. I'm, I'm right. fairly well read. But if I'm going to teach you something, it better be right out of the Bible. Yes, yes. Well, uh, so I, I think there are a lot of Christians, uh, and, and then there are Jews and Muslims and other people of other faiths, who wrestle with how to take their own private experience of faith and faith that happens in their families and in their uh, religious communities and, uh, and live it uh, in the public square, in their place of, of, of work. Uh, what are some of the keys that you learned about that, Troy, the, to get over some of the fear of, of doing the wrong thing or what? Well, I think you have to respect other people's beliefs, but yes. I'll give you a good example of of something that came to me, and I think this is Holy Spirit help as well. I'm fairly often asked to do an invocation mm -hmm. at a secular event. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm sure you've been at places like that, and, mm -hmm. and there are other faiths represented in the room other than Christianity, and so Jesus' name never gets mentioned in the prayer. Yes. Well, I think that as a Christian, you have to stand up for Jesus, but I think I've been led to a way that gets around that. When I do such a prayer, at the end I will say, with respect and acknowledgement that there are several religious faiths represented in this room tonight, because I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, I offer this prayer in his name, ah. amen. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did that once, and the guy who was our speaker, a guy named Dr. Elliot Engel, brilliant English teacher, is Orthodox Jew. I sat down and he said, and I remember he's an English teacher, he says, I've never heard an invocateur say just exactly that. It's the first time I've heard the word invocateur, but <laughs> I guess that's a guy that gives the invocation. Yeah. And he said, let me think about that. I'm an Orthodox Jew. <laughs> okay, I'm not offended. That was well done. <laughs> because, you know, you respect other people's religions, but if you don't mention Jesus, people say, I thought he was a Christian. Why didn't he, why didn't right. he say something? Yeah. It's, it's a difficult line to walk, isn't it? It is. Because um, we, uh, true pluralism, uh, is actually not a kind of uh, watered-down civil religion where uh, everyone has to park their particular faith at the door mm -hmm. and just look for uh, a, a sort of generic thing. Mm -hmm. We want actually to listen to one another and respect one another. 
Uh, and yet we also know that um, the, the default religion in a culture has often been unkind and, uh, and, and not uh, mm -hmm. generous toward those mm -hmm. who are in more minority faiths. So this is quite a clever thing to do. Well, it's nice. you, you cannot hit people over the head with Jesus. Right. You can, right. but that's not going to work. Yes. So uh, we had a news director at Channel 8, uh -huh. Jewish guy, and really good guy, keeps kosher, reads in synagogue, speaks right. Hebrew. Uh -huh. And I had a better relationship with him than the previous guy who was a Southern Baptist. Uh -huh. Okay, we were friends, but this guy, I'd walk by his office and say, hey, come on, let's schmooze. Yeah. And we'd talk, we'd talk about his Judaism, about uh -huh. my Christianity. Mm -hmm. He wasn't threatened by my Jesus. Right. And I wasn't threatened by him because we were trying to get on the same page here as close as we could, yes. even though that one thing is the all important. Mm -hmm. But before he left to go to an assignment in Washington, D.C., I gave him a Bible that I got from Master Media, and uh, it had his name in gold on the front, and in the beginning of it, it has all the Messianic passages in the Old Testament mm -hmm. outlined. Yeah. And the day he left, he came by my office, he says, I'm going to have that book on my desk. Wow. You know what? Is that and whether he ever becomes a Christian believer, I don't know, but I love him anyway. Right. One of my favorite stories is uh, from Eastern Europe, actually, the, the uh, founder of um, Hasidic Judaism uh, was a rabbi who uh, uh, one day was observing with some of uh, his disciples as uh, Christians were walking past uh, their um, cathedral uh, mm -hmm. and normally those who were more pious would stop and uh, would cross themselves mm -hmm. and, and, and then they'd, they'd go on. And he observed this and he was telling his, his uh, followers to observe this. And, and then a prominent member of the community, as I recall the story, uh, went by and failed to stop and uh, pay mm -hmm. religious uh, homage. Uh, and, and he said, uh, that's not a man to be trusted, uh, <laughs> in, in effect. <laughs> and, 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 you know, which, which I think is a beautiful story of a recognition that yes. we should be able to see the earnestness of religious conviction mm -hmm. in someone else's faith yes. uh, as a sign of spiritual integrity and that in our pluralistic world, mm -hmm. not expect them to be like us, but expect them to be more like them yes. uh, in, in, in the way they approach that. You know, Penn Gillette of Gillette, Penn and Teller. Yes. Uh, he's, he's a famous atheist, yes. but somebody came up to him after show, gave him a Bible and uh -huh. it witnessed to him. And afterward, he made a public statement. He said, you know, I'm still an atheist. But this guy is a Christian, and if, if you believe what he does, how can you not do what he did? Isn't that lovely? He yes. respected him, even Very though he good. hadn't come to believe. Very good. And I, had, I had an intern, and uh, he was a Jewish kid. His father's a rabbi. He was right. a rabbi here, now he's in Palm Springs. I call him the showbiz rabbi now. Uh -huh, but, yeah. but Aaron, his son, it was during the Bible studies, and Aaron said, can I come to one of your Bible studies? And uh -huh. I said, well, we got to talk about this, Aaron, because right. your dad's going to say, I thought you were there to study weather. Why are you going to a Christian Bible study? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We had lunch with the rabbi and his wife and Aaron one day, and, and the guy encouraged it. He said, no, go. So afterward, I said, so what did you think? And Aaron said, two things. One, when we pray, we look toward heaven. When you pray, most of you bow your heads. And the other thing, he said, why was Scott Sam's so concerned that this friend we know and knew had died and he had never talked to him about Jesus. Mm -hmm. But I said, well, because Scott was concerned that, that he was not a believer and was not gonna be saved and spend eternity in hell. And he said, oh, okay, I get that. Oh, interesting. But you know, it was just, why was Scott so concerned he had not witnessed right. to this guy? Right. Turns right. out the guy was a believer, so yes. he's fine. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, uh, so I understand that in addition to uh, your life here in Dallas, you love to travel. And we do. one of the things you love to do, you're, you and your wife are fans of, of wine. And uh, tell, tell us about the experience of going to a vineyard in Sonoma mm -hmm. and uh, the, uh, the, the wine and word experience you had. Our pastor at the time, fellow named Hal Habecker, he and Vicki have a daughter named Jennifer and her husband is Mark McAllister, they own a winery in Sonoma, California called Arista. Well, Hal and the son-in-law had this idea, why don't we teach John 15, the vine and the branches, in the vineyard? Mm -hmm. And so they do this every year. We went twice. It's a very limited number of people, so we let other people take our place now. But to sit there for three days in the middle of the vineyard and walk out among the vines and talk about 
the root and the stock and the branches and the vine and all the relationships is God the Father, God the Son, mm -hmm. Holy Spirit, and to just pick the berries and to be out there with nature and mm -hmm. then to sit down and have a wonderful lunch with some Marista wine and dinner as well. And, and communion in the vineyard the last night. It's, right. it's a really good spiritual experience and mm -hmm. it's biblical and it's just also fun. Well, that's so wonderful. wine in the word, it's in August and uh, uh -huh. you could uh, ask about it. Uh, our Hobbick, my Hal Hobbaker's ministry is called uh, Finishing Well now. You could look him up online. It's pretty, I'm pretty sure it's sold out this year, but yeah. it's a really wonderful thing to go to. Well, it's a wonderful passage of scripture that actually teaches us some beautiful things about um, over and over it talks about abiding mm -hmm. in, 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 in uh, Christ uh, and, and, and that sense of remaining, staying, meditating, not necessarily trying to do for God, but to, to draw your life from, uh, from mm -hmm. God. And that doesn't happen automatically, does it? it That's right. It, 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 it abiding takes, is a tough word. It's like there's more to it than, more to it than just staying someplace. It's, it's staying with faith and confidence and uh, commitment, right. abiding, it's a great word. Right, it is, and it's not something that fits our American experience too well. Uh, that's very uh, true. <laughs> yes. It actually probably helps to put the smartphone away uh, if, you're, if you're going to abide. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I uh, have a friend, Nancy Kasten, rabbi um, uh, here in Dallas, and. Uh, she she talks about how she can't actually get up and watch the news first in the morning mm -hmm. because uh, she she needs to be able to start her day uh, with uh, more meditating upon God and 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 and, mm -hmm. and and trying to get centered in life about what is really true before she gets to the news of the day. And I, I think I, that's I understand a, that. Yeah. yeah, my bride gets up and turns on the TV. I, normally, I don't turn the TV maybe ever, but certainly for a long time, because right. there's a concept that uh, author Henry Nguyen called stillness, yes. which is more than sitting still, and it's more yes. than being quiet. Right. I have a dear friend who recently fell off a ladder. Well, fortunately, he didn't injure himself that badly, but tore a retina. Mm -hmm. Well, he had to have retinal surgery, and the guy said, the doctor said, you're going to have to lie on your right side for two weeks and just not move. Coincidentally, this guy had told me that that God has just been telling him he wants him to do something in addition to what he's doing spiritually. Wow. He's a performer, he's an illusionist, yes. and a master of the mind, he says. Wow. Not a mind reader, no such right. thing. But I said, here's the deal, David. God wants you to experience stillness. You're gonna wow. have to be there, and he's a type A person anyway. Right. Use this time of stillness to find out what God wants you to do, wow. and call me if I can be of encouragement, but I think, Stillness in the morning is very important. I, I do my primary prayer time out of my walk in the morning. You train mm. yourself not to get run over. Yes, right. right. But, you know, I'm out there for about 40 minutes and the first oh. 25 minutes of that, it's just a wonderful mm. time of solitude and prayer. Good. And Good. What a great way to start You mean day. you don't have earphones in with m music playing? And I only, no, I have, I have the earphones only for when I finish the prayer time. Okay. And at that point, it's usually either Robert Jeffers or Chuck Swindoll okay, that's right. on KCBI. There you go. So okay. I, I talk to God and listen, and then I listen to them too. Very good. <laughs> well, that's terrific. Well, uh, so um, it, I, I'd like to explore a little more too about some of uh, the work you did for charity while you were uh, <laughs> the, the weatherman at uh, Channel 8, because that was an extraordinary uh, program that uh, uh, changed a lot of people's lives, I think. Santa's Helpers. Santa's Helpers. Santa's Helpers. That's one of those things where, uh, okay, I came here in July of 1976, mm -hmm. and along about November, they said, oh, by the way, of course, you will be the spokesman for Santa's Helpers. And I said, what's that? Yes. Well, it wasn't much at that time. We just placed okay. boxes around in shopping malls, and you mentioned on the air, please put in a new and unwrapped toy. But over the years, it became bigger. In fact, one year, we knew we were going to need a lot more toys, so a young lady named Phyllis Watson was one of our anchors, and she said, why don't we have a deal where we ask people to come downtown on a certain mm -hmm. night and bring a toy? Mm -hmm. And we thought, okay, we'll try it. We didn't know if anybody would show up or not. And sure enough, that night it looked like that last scene in the movie, Field of Dreams, right. where headlights as far as you can see. Yes. And that grew to having not just one night, but a night in Dallas, a night in Fort Worth, right. and then there are various locations. Now I think there are probably at least five or six of those. But that's where 
Pete Delkis gets to do this now, I would get to stand outside for five or six hours in the cold or rain or yes. whatever it was, and invariably I would get sick in January, but oh. that's just the price you do you have to pay. However, what a great program. Yeah. Because thousands of kids uh, had Christmas gifts that wouldn't have had them otherwise. Right. We would have people come up on that night when I was standing out in front of the studio in Dallas and say, here, I brought you a toy, and you know what? Because you gave me a toy when I was a little kid. The next generation that benefited from it comes back now to take part in it. Wow. It's still a wonderful thing. I did that for 32 Christmases. That's terrific. And when I got finished with that, I did one more while I was still just partially related to the station. And after that, I said, you know, I'm old enough that I'm going to let you have this, Pete. Terrific. But it's still a wonderful program. Santa's Helpers, when you hear about that, Bring a new and unwrapped toy, and you'll be glad you did it. <laughs> Terrific. Well, let's pick that up after the break. Sure. I want to explore a little more about that. Children's Medical Center's mission is to make life better for children. Here are some of their heroes. They had their lives saved by children's and then helped others by giving back. There are so many more, and you can help them by supporting the fundraising efforts of Children's Medical Center Foundation. Just go to childrens.com and click on I Choose Children's. Be a hero yourself. Troy, you were talking about Santa's helpers, and uh, there's, there's two dimensions to our service, uh, I think. There's uh, the, the actual help that we give to other people, and then there's uh, how it helps us as we help, right, mm -hmm. and how it changes us. Let's begin, though, talking about the, the effect of this work of Santa's helpers. Where did the toys go, and what, what was the experience of those who received them and the need that they had? Uh, I, this may have changed, but at least in my day, the toys were distributed through community centers, okay. social workers mm -hmm. that we knew we could trust mm -hmm. to have people on their list, mm -hmm. where not that anybody would, maybe, but nobody would double dip. If they're going to get toys from here, mm -hmm. they're not going to go to this other Martin right. Luther King Center or wherever it was, American Indian Center. And there were people that we could trust to distribute the toys well. Right. And uh, people are just immensely generous. Yes. On those nights when we'd be out in front of the station, here would come a big flatbed truck with 50 bicycles on it. My goodness. And yet, you're just as happy when a little kid hands you a teddy bear that came from the money that he or she was going to get for Christmas. Right. The generosity that it teaches people it also comes back on us. It teaches us to be generous with our, our time and our attitude as well. So I think generosity and gratitude are really related in this way, aren't they? Mm -hmm. that, uh, and and that, that passage that you use on the Sunday where you want them to have, give more money. Yes, yes. Don't give grudging their necessity. But you see, the thing is, that's not just talking about money. Right. The Lord loves a cheerful giver of time and attitude. Right. Money is important, sure, but it's, it's what you do otherwise, as you're alluding to this. It's our responsibility to be generous with our time and mm -hmm. our money and our attitude. I, uh, years ago, I sort of struck on something when I was talking about giving in church, and that is, you know, that we, we, we tend to talk about sacrificial giving, uh, and, and we, we like to use a phrase like, give until it hurts. <laughs> give, give, give until you feel the loss of it. Give until <laughs> it just pains you to give. Not just because you could give tip money, but because it's, you know. And, and then it occurred to me that whole cheerful giving thing, you should really <laughs> give until it, it gives you joy. Give until it feels good. That's exactly you know? right. And, and if you're not experiencing the joy of giving, then you're not really tapped into the whole nature of it, are you? Well, that is so true. I hadn't actually thought of that, but uh -huh. give till it hurts is not what you want to do. Yeah. Give till you understand you're supposed to be doing this, and because you do, wow, I'm getting something out of this. Exactly. Because I'm able to do this. Right. Okay, sacrificially, fine, but that doesn't yeah. mean it's going to hurt. It right. means it's going to make you feel better. Right. Don't we sacrifice mm -hmm. for the people we love and the things we care about and then you know if we're a parent sacrificing for a child it doesn't you know that that's our joy of that's, course it's, it's, it's yeah. our, the thing that we really love and care about yep that's beautiful it's our privilege to get to do that so after your time with WFAA uh, I understand you stayed in touch with some of your pals uh, yes, Tracy indeed. Rowlett and others Tracy Rowlett and a fellow named John Good Johnson who was a, a photographer 
Well, we try to meet the three couples of us once a month uh -huh. at Dunstan's, the old steakhouse on uh -huh. Lover's Lane, and take turns paying the check. And Tracy always complains. <laughs> he says, he says don't get the lobster, it's not very good. <laughs> but Tracy's a wonderful guy. We have been friends now for 42 years. Uh -huh. And uh, if you don't set a time like that where you're going to see each other, right. and sometimes we'll have to miss a month, but if you don't do that, a year can get by and you haven't seen your friends. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we make it a point to try to do that. Our friendship still means a lot to us. Tracy's a good, strong believer as well, so is his wife. All of the, all of the people in the weather department that we've had at Channel 8 have all been believers. In fact, I'm so proud of Greg, uh, the young guy that's been the weather guy there for many, many years. Greg, what's his last name? Fields. Fields, Greg Fields. Greg Fields. Just got his master's degree at Dallas Seminary. How about that? And I thought, I am just knocked over. I knew he was a strong believer, a good yeah. Baptist boy, but uh -huh. I haven't had a chance to talk to him about that to see nice. what he's going to do with it. Terrific. But isn't that just neat? That's neat. That's really great. Yeah. So uh, you all got together on a, a, a new program uh, with some of your friends, yeah, we, and, and that became an interesting uh, sort of post-career thing that uh, made it, a contribution. It was. To it. it was in 2013. These. This guy had the idea to start up a, a TV show on a little startup station, Channel 47, mm -hmm. to bring back people that used to be on TV. He said, mm -hmm. you knew them, now get to know them. And several of us were kind of hesitant to do this. Mm -hmm. So we were going to go over and, and talk to this guy about it. And I thought, I don't want to do this. And I'm, I'm reading through Proverbs. My friend Dennis Swanberg is a Christian. Well, I know comedian. Dennis, yeah. He we says, were in seminary read, together. Or, uh, yeah. What a great guy. Yeah, and it, yeah. He says, read Proverbs once a month because it's got 31 chapters. Right, right. And my wife said 31 doesn't belong in there anyway. Uh, well, you've read 31. <laughs> yeah, I know. Right. No, no, my wife is the Proverbs 31 yeah, uh -huh. woman, but yeah. she doesn't go buy a field and milk the goats and all yes, that right. contextually. But anyway, so Dennis said, read that every month. And I do, and it never gets old. Well, it happened that that day I was reading the one about... Uh, he who answers a question before he hears it, it is a, full and a folly and a shame to him. I said, I think I'm supposed to go listen to what this guy's got to say. Mm -hmm. And I did, and we decided to go to work there. So Tracy and I would sit there on Monday and Tuesday, our two days, drink coffee for a half hour, be on the air for a, an hour, talk about whatever we wanted, and just had a wonderful time. Made contact with a friend I'd known a long time, John Sparks, made the spiritual connection with him. We now go to the same church. You had dinner with them Saturday night. Mm -hmm. They're in our small group from church. And it's been a friendship that would not have blossomed had it not been for that year. It's the most fun we ever had in television. Didn't make a lot of money, but we'd already made the money at that point. This was more for enjoyment. What a well, great experience it was. It, it probably was more for enjoyment, but when you talk to me uh, off camera about John and, uh, and, and that whole thing, it, it occurs to me that by saying yes, to that experience of saying, yes, I'm going to explore this, I'm going to mm -hmm. open myself up to a new adventure, mm -hmm. there, then way leads on to way. And this is the way the spirit works in our life, right? Mm -hmm. And it, it, it occurs to me that that's also sort of the story of the early church, uh, how uh, we think of the so-called missionary journeys of Paul and, mm -hmm. and Silas and Barnabas, and, and we, we think that maybe they were sort of planned or intentional mission trips that they took. But in a way, it was really just saying yes at each stop, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. And then yeah. what happens next? And it's, it's kind of that open-heartedness uh, that, uh, uh, that, that then we give God an opportunity to work in our lives and to see what else might happen. Yeah, you don't say no to anything, but you just, you wait and see, am I supposed to do this? And, right. and you, you pray about it, for yes. goodness sake. Right. And that works too, doesn't it? Right, right, yeah. It's a matter <laughs> so of that fact. was a great experience. We've become closer friends with, with John and his wife, and, and we still see the others occasionally as well. Susie Humphreys, I mean, Iola Johnson. Iola Johnson uh, yes. was a, a power in this market for quite some time. Uh -huh. She was the first black female anchor. Right. And as such, under a lot of pressure. Hmm. Iola was not fun to work with. And you could mm -hmm. see why, because yeah. she had a real big, strong monkey on her back yes. the whole time. The year that we worked together at Channel 47, no pressure. Relaxed. She was just a sweetheart. And what a great way to get to know somebody better right. after a situation that was not always pleasant. That year it was terrifically pleasant. Lovely. And now we're a different kind of friends. Wonderful. Troy, we just have a few minutes left. I, I wonder if, as a, as a person who's been a, a believer in Jesus and a Christian for really all your life long, as much as you can remember, mm -hmm. 
I think perseverance and staying with it is a really big part. What would you say to people uh, who uh, are going through difficult times in their life, uh, changes uh, that are happening in their families or in their health or in their workplace, uh, uh, words of encouragement about what you've learned over the long course of staying with the faith? Well, it's very difficult to trust God because the answers to the prayers are not going to be necessarily the ones you want. and. Uh, we were talking a little bit earlier about uh, Moses. I mean, Pharaoh said, no, I'm not going to let your people go. In fact, they're going to have to work harder. Right. And God said to Moses, I got this. Yeah. You just do what you're supposed to do, right. and God's going to do what he's going to do. So we may not get what we would think are the blessings that we want, but we'll always get what God wants us to have. Mm -hmm. And that's what it's all about, coming right. to terms with that right. and trusting God. is It's difficult, but once you do it, you can say, Ah, yes. I can relax. It reminds me of my, my own dad. Um, he's uh, coming up on the second anniversaries of his, of his death. He, he was 90 when he died, um, but a Christian for all of his adult life. And, uh, uh, and over time, he, um, he sort of, um, how shall I say this? He, he relaxed into his faith in a way mm. that was really beautiful. Uh, his retirement years were the best years of his faith. Uh, and I, uh, if, you, if you ask anyone in our church or anyone who knew him in the last oh, eight or ten years of his life, when they'd say to him, uh, how are you doing, George? He would always say, blessed, mm -hmm. blessed. And that became a, a, a mantra for him. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, sometimes we drive down the street and we see somebody in a Maserati who has blessed on his license plate. And it doesn't really sit too well with me, you know. <laughs> no. uh, yeah, no. we, we know. Thanks very much for sharing that, mm -hmm. you know. But that's not what my dad meant, you know. What my dad meant was more of what you're talking about, Troy, is this uh, sense of being able to look at your life and see that it's a gift and mm -hmm. that God has this and you're okay. Oh, just sitting here with you doing this? I mean, blessed? I guess so. Yeah. What a, what a great life I've got. Beautiful wife and family, church. My faith's important to me. I, I get to do speaking engagements about this book, which is essentially right. exhorting people to do more with their faith. So, right. blessed, I guess I am with a capital B. Terrific. Well, uh, you have um, children and grandchildren mm -hmm. now as well, mm -hmm. and you're seeing them grow in the faith also. Yes, indeed. Our granddaughters are 11 next month, or next week and six, and they go to a Christian school, and they have already become Christian believers. Terrific. My wife has made sure of that. In fact, the six-year-old this, this past uh, spring, she said, uh, Nana, you don't have to worry about that. I know Jesus. I'm good. I'm good, Nana. <laughs> that's, okay. got that's, that's really good. Well, and I'm watching my own children, and, and my, I have three children and five grandchildren Look now. Out. It's a beautiful yes. thing. Oh, my goodness. Uh, and uh, it's, it's wonderful to see how uh, they are growing up in the church, and, and they have a kind of sense of enchantment about this is my father's world. Mm -hmm. uh, they are not growing up with uh, the feeling of uh, uh, whether uh, there is such a thing as God, but God is very much a part of every way they imagine the world and the things going on in it. Isn't that encouraging That's the beautiful to see thing. that in them? Yes. It's the beautiful thing to watch about it. Isn't yeah. it? Terrific. Well, Troy, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, my privilege. Uh, my pleasure. Thank you, Pastor George. It's been a great experience. Well, I know that so many people probably have watched you through the years and didn't get to know who you are so much as what you did. They did trust you, though, uh, <laughs> or you wouldn't have stayed on that long. Well, that's true. And, Again, uh, I was blessed. And you were blessed, but so were we through you. Well, thank so, you. Thank all you. the best. Great. Thanks so much, Thank Troy. you very much. Bless you.
YMCA of Metropolitan Dallas welcomes neighbors each day to make sure everyone, regardless of age, income, or background, has the opportunity to learn, grow, and thrive. The YMCA's annual campaign enables the Y to provide free or discounted memberships and programs to the people who need them the most, making our community safer, stronger, and healthier. The Y has always been a place of possibility and a promise for all.